and central banks are printing excess and amounts of liquidity. If we really reach one day where the US dollar hits hyperinflation, that kind of doomsday libertarian kind of thesis of why Bitcoin would have been valuable in the first place, it could happen, right? Things like that can happen in the real world. The world is becoming increasingly volatile. So I think yeah. that's where Bitcoin really shines. And that's what's going to carry out the next cycles over the long term. Dear crypto community blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have the one and only Nicholas Merton, aka Data Dash, one of the biggest crypto YouTubers, educators, influencers, but on top of that, the founder of a really cool company called Digifox. It's such a pleasure to have such a legend and we're going to provide you with awesome content related to number one, crypto investing, number two, crypto earning. And before we kick off, a big shout out to Amin from The Capital for always sourcing us with great themes, topics, and questions. Check out their blogs. They're really, really good. Without further ado, Nicholas Merton, aka Data Dash. A pleasure to have you, Nicholas, today, buddy. Alex, thanks for having me, man. It's always a pleasure. So before we kick off, Nicholas, I would love to tell you about how I discovered Data Dash. So I was in Japan, 2017. It was winter, I believe. And I remember I was listening to YouTube, crypto content on YouTube. And all of a sudden I hear some really interesting information. And I was like, wow, this guy's really smart. And I turn around, I look at the screen and I see you, a really young gentleman sharing us about some really, really good content. And just to tease you a little bit, has anyone ever asked about your age or bothered you about that before? Yeah, well, I appreciate it, Alex. I'm glad you were following the content back as far as 2017 when we started the channel. Uh, but yeah, no, it's been a it's been a real privilege because for myself, you know, I basically, for my personal finance journey and stuff, it started off quite early. Uh, for me, the first time I ever invested was when I opened up a joint brokerage account with my dad at my like local bank branch, and it, it's pretty wild to go from the kind of world of stock investing into investing in commodities, looking at bonds. Uh, looking at different types of markets as well, and even delving into the emerging space of cryptocurrencies. And just to think, you know, that people would want to kind of, you know, some people, maybe not everyone, but some people would want to listen to me on YouTube. It, it always kind of blew me back because I would always want to teach my friends how to invest, show them how to trade or get into, you know, trading stocks back when I was in high school and I was going through college. And the funny thing is no one really like it would want to listen in about five to 10 minutes. I'd usually put people to sleep. And I was always under the, the, uh, the assumption. I was like, okay, I'm probably doing something wrong. Uh, you know, I'm probably not good at explaining this or I'm probably making it too complex. So uh, yeah, I've gotten a lot of people as I've, I've done this journey through crypto and it's, it's always kind of a, a constant shocker to me. I'm, I'm always very humbled by it, but uh, there's always stuff to learn. I still have a lot to learn myself. And I think uh, just going through the crypto space, I've learned more than any other markets combined. It really shows you about the human nature of markets. Uh, along with that as well, it shows you uh, that there's a lot of exciting potential right on the horizon. We're at an exponential rate of innovation and growth. There's new things happening every day in the crypto space. And it's a matter of really understanding what's valuable within the blockchain space. I think that's helped me with fundamental analysis more than anything. Like what is a blockchain or what do cryptocurrencies actually offer to a wider audience? So yeah, I, I appreciate it, Alex. It's, it's nice to hear that you, uh, you've you been impressed by that as well. And uh, I more than anything believe I've got a long way to go and I've got a lot more to learn over the next few years. It's awesome to see that you're that humble and a big shout out to Jeff Merton, your dad, who's definitely a great mentor. I heard many good things about him as a person. You talked about learning lessons, you know, from age 13. Like if you don't mind sharing a few of the awesome lessons that your dad taught you, maybe you learned along the way. That would be really cool. Yeah, so I think more than anything, uh, I can thank my dad for his worth ethic. He's been always uh, alongside my mom as well. Like both of them uh, throughout my childhood were not only great parents, uh, but they really just showcased to me, both of them ran like a cleaning company when they were together at the time. And, uh, you know, that's how they took care of our family. And my dad continued to work in the restaurant business. My mom continued cleaning. So they never really came from like a, a crazy upbringing or anything like that. And I think that worth ethic really kind of shaped me uh, towards being appreciative on uh, things in life. I think those were the really early signs and stuff 
that that kind of helped me towards getting towards the point where I am today. But in regards to like investing in markets, you know, the reason I actually got alerted into it was I saw my dad constantly trading. I remember visions in my childhood, like very faint visions where I'd see my dad on the e-trading terminal, you know, you know, typing away, making trades during the kind of early 2000s when he was getting into day trading. And I, interestingly enough, got into trading as well um, when I was, again, around 12, 13. So I went towards actually set up the brokerage account and I placed two trades. Uh, I, my dad gave me like $900 just to kind of delve around and test out the markets that he had had. And I bought $450 of like a solar company that was based out of China and $450 of a medical marijuana penny stocks. <laughs> you know, speaking, speaking, I think this is a great segue into your point about learning <laughs> learning the hard way by yourself. Uh, no matter how much my dad could tell me otherwise, I had to get burned a little bit and learn that penny stocks are usually not a good bet. So I lost like I think $100, $200 on that. But on the Canadian or on the uh, solar trade in this case that I placed, uh, I made an equal amount from what I lost. So I broke even. And it was a, that's if you can break even on your first trade or investment, that's usually a good start. So um, after that, I just basically kept delving into markets. I started to learn a lot of principles, like not trading on really uh, high risk plays like that, trying to find a good risk to reward profile. Uh, and outside of that, really focusing on longer term uh, kind of horizons in regards to trades. And rather than doing day trading, I learned that, you know, swing trading or long term investing was usually the better bet for most people. The uh, po probabilities of actually making a stellar return were there. And I've really started to mold that and a lot of other principles as I've gotten into crypto. Uh, it is improved as I've gotten into crypto, ironically enough, it's further improved my ability to trade equity markets, to trade commodity markets anything else and it's it's amazing how much similarities there are in the sense of just uh, how i've been able to adjust my trading strategy in crypto and how i can carry that over to other markets and you just mentioned that you were grateful that you actually dived into the cryptocurrency market specifically and i know a lot of people have actually told me the exact same thing they said that you learn a lot more from the crypto markets than staying in traditional markets sometimes some people say like you know being in the jungle in the far or in the far far west or the wild wild west is uh, teaches you more than being in a civil, you know, street, you know, where you have pedestrians walking on sidewalks. But <laughs> for the lack of a better analogy, uh, what made you really feel like the crypto market specifically taught you more than what you would have learned elsewhere? Yeah, I think after going through 2017, what I started to realize, especially, was how much similarities crypto had with the traditional worlds. The first thing that I came to really learn is that as much as there is an element of fundamentals to everything, uh, and again, this is why I think in the long term, blockchain is going to become much more fundamental. People are really going to be looking for real use cases that drive real volume or revenue, whatever you want to call it. Um, I learned that at the end of the day, whether it's crypto, whether it's equities, and even things like precious metals or government bonds and treasuries, nothing's fundamental entirely at the end of the day. Uh, there's always elements of speculation because so long as there are humans in the equation and so long as there are algorithms that are trading off that human emotion and playing into it and you know betting against it, uh, you are always going to have irrational markets, valuations that will go far beyond what might be the fundamental value of something. Uh, and that's why we had the ICO bubble in 2017. Uh, and speaking to that as well, I learned how you know, through the crypto market, uh, with all the new token sales that were going on, all the new cryptocurrencies that were coming out, there was a layered process and stuff, just like traditional venture capital to an exit, such as an IPO. Uh, and that's exactly what ICOs were, it was just in a tokenized format and for something that wasn't tied to equity of a company in most cases. So I started to really learn a lot more about the traditional world and get more of a visual understanding of it simply from cryptocurrencies alone. And I would say outside of that, um, you know, again, fundamental analysis works a little bit different in crypto because it's a lot more about uh, th considering things like token models and outside of that as well, keeping in mind whether or not something actually benefits from having uh, something that can remove intermediaries or third parties. So in this case, you know, again, a lot of financial applications stood out to me as one of the key use cases for this technology, just like how the Internet services certain needs as well, like communication, you know, file storage, things of that sort. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's really, really well put. I have a question with you regards to one of the hottest news of the day. There has been a post recently from JP Morgan, which could be perhaps the most bullish news coming from Wall Street in the history of cryptocurrency, where JP Morgan mentioned that the coin and Bitcoin, the market structure, the cryptocurrency market structure turned out to be more resilient than those of currencies, equities, treasuries and gold this year. 
So yeah. quite bullish, you know, coming from a more, more of a traditional uh, bank, of course. But also we heard the opposite side where, you know, Goldman Sachs was basically rehashing what everyone was saying in 2017, 2016 about how this is, you know, drug money and, you know, the whole Silk Road debate and stuff like that. Uh, how, how do you react to this kind of news? What is it telling you? Yeah, Alex, well, I think to, you know, kind of take it at a surface level, you know, the numbers don't lie at the end of the day. The thing that I've always tried to bring up to people, I have a lot of people who always say, you know, Bitcoin's volatile, it does this or that, and, uh, you know, still might not understand what it is, but it is the best performing asset here in 2020. Uh, if you're talking about broad market assets like gold or stocks or bonds, it's the best performing asset by far. It's well above uh, where it was at its highs back at the start of the year you know, a few thousand dollars higher, even with one of the worst sell-off days, bear in mind, back in March, uh, when we had the second worst sell-off day for Bitcoin and the worst sell-off day for Ethereum, the top leading digital assets have continued to lead the way. And you have to basically get to this point where you're just constantly making slanderous remarks like Goldman Sachs did against Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies if you want to try to make some kind of argument against it. I did a whole tweet storm the day that that report came out, and I was able to basically dismantle every single key point that they put out. Uh, I'm trying to think back now. I think that they'd said that Bitcoin wasn't a hedge against inflation. Uh, Bitcoin's been the best performing asset for the last 10 years. I mean, <laughs> I, I think honestly, that's the last argument you want to make and stuff. Now, I, I understand my, what some people might say is that, oh, well, it's not directly tied to inflation, right? Like, so as inflation has gone up, Bitcoin hasn't directly moved with it. Uh, and that's that's a false argument because gold and, for example, even equities are hedges against inflation. And they don't move exactly with inflation 24-7. Gold was in a bear market over the last few years when the Fed had record levels of quantitative easing and is now finally just cashing up. But that doesn't make gold a bad asset, right? It's done its job of hedging against inflation over the longer term. Uh, but again, you know, all these arguments and stuff are very petty, very outdated, and very kind of like pigeonholed arguments against Bitcoin, when in reality, most of them can be disproven. And Bitcoin's done exactly what it needs to do. It's it's basically a non-correlated um, asymmetric asset that basically allows you to, you know, hold a limited supply of a certain asset to see these exponential rises once the halving event kicks in, when uh, the hodl waves start to signal that more people are holding long-term rather than speculating in the short term. We've been, we just recently actually set the highest level of Bitcoin that haven't been moved for over a year uh, since 2016. So this is a really clear sign alongside the halving event that we're kicking into that next cycle that we're probably eventually going to get back up to around 20,000 and then shoot out to new exponential highs. And there's no other asset that can do that. Equities are not going to double in the next year. Gold, as much as I love it, maybe silver, but probably not gold. Gold is not going to double in the next year. It's a $10 trillion market. So for it to double, it needs to go to twenty trillion dollar mar uh, a twenty trillion dollar market cap. In the case of uh, you know Bitcoin, on the other hand, you're dealing with an asset that right now at this moment is sitting around like one hundred sixty five, hundred seventy billion dollar market cap. I might be off a, bit, a tad bit there. If you want that to double, right? Let's just rough it off and let's say it's two hundred billion dollars. And all it needs to do is just go to four hundred billion dollars in market cap. That's very attainable. It doesn't require much liquidity to reach that point. And it would be very reasonable to see Bitcoin go there because we've seen it before. So again, as a, as a trader and an investor, you know, when I look at it from that kind of thesis, I look for something that's got that potential to multiply time and time over again. And Bitcoin is the only asset that's probably going to be doing that alongside altcoins and other cryptocurrencies over the next few years. So that's kind of my, my kind of broad thesis and response to them. I think that people are starting to slowly step away uh, from these institutions, and it'll get to a point where they have to start offering cryptocurrency services. I made a bet that Goldman and Sachs would in the next three years be offering cryptocurrency trading and investment services. So we'll see if uh, <laughs> let's see. And I, I basically said I'm putting my money where my mouth is. I'm, I'm long Bitcoin. I'm long crypto, uh, and we'll see what happens. Oh man, I can't wait until you win that bet. That's going to be so funny. I, sh I should have made the same one. Can I join? Can I, can I jump in? <laughs> but I think you you brought a really good point, Nicholas. Like you brought the point that you know for their confirmation bias, they take very specific time frames just to show that, you know, Bitcoin isn't a hedge or isn't a safe haven. It's really terrible, you know, how they, they're they so um, picky about, you know, the specific things to confirm uh, something that is obviously not true. So it's really good that you mentioned that. Yeah, you know, to build on that, Alex, one thing that I, I, I kind of define myself as, like if I were to find a label for how I trade or invest, some people ask, Nick, are you long-term investor or are you day trader? I'm actually probably neither of them. I'm a macro trader. So a macro trader usually does swing trading. They take, you know, multi-month positions, but they don't hold something forever. Um, and the major thing I'm looking for 
is markets with massive potential. I'm looking for emerging technology sectors. I'm looking for entirely new industries, something I can park my wealth into that over the next couple of months to the next year or so, I can double, triple, quadruple. You know, that's that's kind of the, the whole gist of it. And what's nice is that, you know, in this world, there's so many opportunities like that. You just have to know where to look and you have to constantly be on your toes. And um, above all, to speaking to that point, Alex, is to not be biased, right? I, I yes, I'll, I'll be honest in, in saying that I do love cryptocurrencies as a technology because yes, a lot of it is aligned with what I personally believe in. I think it is going to be the technology that uplifts a ton of people across the world, especially where the traditional banking industry that we were just talking about has left behind billions of people, whether it's the unbanked, whether it's everyday people who may have a bank account and aren't earning anything on their savings, don't have the tools to plan for their finances, et cetera, right? I do see the vision of it. Above all, though, I know that it's an asset market that's got room to grow, unlike other markets that are, are heavily overinflated right now. Not to not to say that they won't grow, but not to the kind of exponential returns that crypto will. Uh, it's it's simply markets of scale. That's the key term there. It's just to understand, as I was talking about at that point a moment ago, the size of the market gives it much more room to grow in the long term, especially with the kind of value proposition that it brings of a store of value, financial uh, applications and tools, et cetera. Beautifully put. Damn, Nicholas, you're dropping some gems today. So market of scale, Guys, remember that word. It's really important, as we say, is to see how much space there is in terms of movement and how far can we go ex exponentially. So I have a quick question, Nicholas, based on that specific point. Like you mentioned, you know, it's it's much easier for Bitcoin to go from 200 billion market cap to 400 compared to gold going from 10 trillion to 20 trillion. You know, if we look at the stock to flow ratio, which some people love, some people have been critical about, you know, a lot of people say that, you know, the stock to flow model, which predicts a hundred thousand dollars per Bitcoin by 2021, is that doable, or are we? Kind of, it's kind of, it's a bit far fetched at this point. Yeah. So again, actually going back to that uh, up earlier point we made, Alex, I think this is a great point to bring up about the fundamental value of an asset uh, versus what's currently the market price, right? So what we find here with the having event is, uh, and actually more specifically with the the Bitcoin cycles we're actually adding about 11 to 13 months with each new cycle. So what we're gonna start seeing is a pretty big divergence off of the stereotypical four-year cycle that a lot of people talk about. At least this is my take on it. I, so far, we've seen that we've diverged further and further away from the halving model with each cycle. And in 2017, for example, or actually taking a step back to 2016 when we actually initiated the previous halving event before this one, uh, what we found out is that it actually takes a while for that cycle to start kicking off because you need time to have that demand shock, basically the supply and demand shock reflect basically the initial supply drop of the halving event, so less Bitcoin being issued every 10 minutes. And then eventually, as that starts to ticker up price here and we get back above the all-time highs, that's when the supply uh, starts to outflow a little bit more into the market and the demand really comes in to lead prices higher. And that's the unique thing about Bitcoin. It, it just it just takes longer with each cycle. So now that we've gone through our having event, people are like, okay, why isn't Bitcoin at 20K? Well, because it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time for those yeah. supply and demand economics to play out. Um, towards that target of, of the stock to flow going up to 100K in 2021, there's an important thing to note here. If we take a look back at the previous cycle, we should have reached around, uh, I'm trying to remember the actual level off the top of my head right now. I think it was around like nine to 11,000 for Bitcoin at that range. And you can see how actually the, the chart was delayed from what it should have hit, like right here, it was delayed and it actually took a while to reach there. So I think that even though the fundamental value of Bitcoin around that time period under the current stock to flow model should be 100K, and I do believe we're gonna reach 100K, I think it's gonna happen a little bit later than most people. My target range is for November or December of uh, 2022. So nearly going in towards 2023. So we've got a couple of years until we get there. And I, the reason I do that is I like to keep my estimates as conservative as possible. But also when we get to that range of 100K, I'm not gonna just sell everything. We know that Bitcoin, You know, I, I think last time I was thinking the top was gonna to be 10,000 and it went to 20,000 back in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a matter of being prepared to take profits around that range because that is the exponential zone. That's where maximum profit taking capacity is. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to miss out if it goes to 150,000, 200,000. So you can use tools like stop loss or excuse me, um, 
stop like stops for taking profits, uh, all kinds of different mechanisms in that case uh, that I'll be looking to use probably around that time. But I trade those broader cycles again. That's the key thing. Uh, not trying to trade too much in between outside of maybe allocating between Bitcoin and altcoins during this time period. Wow, really, really nice. And I think that's a key point. A lot of people expect it to the stock to flow ratio to react exactly the same as it's been reacting. But as you said, each cycle is starting to extend itself more and more. And that makes a lot of sense because you know, it, it doesn't, it can peak as fast, you know, or maybe in, in the short time frames that it did in the initial having. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I, I want to drill that point and stuff. There's been, uh, technically people will debate on like how many cycles we've had. The three last major uptrends we've had in crypto all the way back since uh, really when markets were formulated back in late 2010, early 2011, uh, we've had th basically three previous major cycles. And each of them has expanded by that 11 to 13 month period. So it's a very key thing to, to keep in mind in that case is that that's the consistency we've seen so far. You can roughly estimate it's about a year, right? 12 months, right? If you want to meet in the middle. So each cycle is going to be expanding a year here. And I think we'll start to see a pretty big divergence where in the long term, the halving model will begin to be a tad bit priced in. People will understand what it is as, as Bitcoin becomes more of an investment class asset. And then really after that, it's going to be the demand shocks when there's issues uh, with uh, you know the traditional banking system when central banks are printing excess of amounts of liquidity. If we really reach one day where the US dollar hits hyperinflation, that kind of doomsday libertarian kind of thesis of why Bitcoin would have been valuable in the first, pay, uh, first place, you know, who knows, it could happen, right? Things like that can happen in the real world. The world is becoming increasingly volatile. So I think yeah. that's where Bitcoin really shines and that's what's going to carry out the next cycles over the long term. Awesome. Well, you, you guys got it all there. We talked a lot about Bitcoin and you just mentioned something really interesting, Nicholas, which is the perfect transition. So going from Bitcoin to cryptocurrency as an asset class. And I think that's a that's a perfect transition because one of your videos on your channel, which we'll put a link below, is you talk about portfolio diversification. And a lot of people obviously, you know, are starting to believe in Bitcoin and it's easier to invest and they're less afraid, et cetera, et cetera. I remember the Coinbase study showing that most of the subsidies from the government went into Bitcoin. Uh, but now the bigger challenge is how to diversify our portfolio. And you made a really interesting video which talked about different market caps. So you had the large, the medium, the micro, small market cap how much percentage you would more or less allocate in each one of those market caps. You also talked about themes. So specific themes, for example, the blockchain infrastructure or the smart contract themes. It's really overwhelming with all the crypto assets out there. So if you don't mind sharing a little bit about portfolio diversification, that would be really cool. Yeah, I, you know, honestly, Alex, that's funny you brought up that video. It's been a while. That was, a, I think, a video I made back in 2017. Or my, maybe I'm, I'm talking about the wrong one. But yeah, there's, a, there's a, a lot of different ways you can go about investing in crypto. Um, so I would definitely say that diversification is important. Like even during uh, when we reach towards these kind of peaks and cycles, sometimes I, I always want to make sure at least to have some exposure to crypto uh, and the kind of broader sense as making sure I have exposure to the broader crypto asset class. But during bull markets, and even during sometimes during bear markets, I like to have holdings in different types of digital assets in the crypto space. So different types of tokens and coins. Uh, the reason why is because in any given investment thesis and stuff, diversification is incredibly key. Uh, you can have your your kind of home runs, you can have ones where you're, you know, 80% allocated to something that you're really confident in if, if you want to take that kind of risk, but you should always make sure to not have all your eggs in one basket. Um, so for example, like this is a, a good thing, kind of taking it at a surface level view, and then I'll dive into more of the altcoin view. Uh, if you're looking at investing in Bitcoin or cryptocurrency assets for the first time, and you're like, man, I don't know what price to get in, I don't know if this is too risky for me. Uh, there's actually an analysis that, uh, that was actually just put out by one of my good friends at uh, Iconic Labs, Patrick. Uh, and he basically summarized uh, something called the Sharper Ratio, which is Sharper Ratio is basically uh, the return you can get on an asset versus like the guaranteed return. And that's usually the yield of treasuries. So, um, you know, basically seeing, you know, how is an asset performing in that case. And he basically analyzed that if you just had a 1% exposure to crypto over the last few years, it would have basically outpaced all of the other portions of your portfolio. So this is the kind of multiples we're talking about. Again, that market's a scale topic uh, that's going on in the cryptocurrency space. So we're working right now uh, you know, to basically analyze, I've been working over the last few months to really analyze what parts of the crypto space I think are going to do those kinds of multiples. Bitcoin alone, as well as Ethereum and Litecoin, some of the larger plays, I have no doubt they'll play a role into it. 
But as you go into those smaller market caps and you try to you try to start to find those gems, maybe in the small to medium caps, these are usually cryptos that are valued between two hundred million dollars to two billion. And you've got serious potentials for returns uh, in the long term. So again, we've been looking. Uh, there's a few different kind of sectors that I'm really interested in. I'm interested in decentralized finance, which is a lot of the new applications that are being built on Ethereum, some of which are tokenized, uh, that allow for decentralized financial services that are permissionless. They're open to anyone. And they allow you to earn interest on your savings. They allow you to make decentralized trades where you and I, Alex, we can make a trade and we don't have to, uh, you know, we don't have to worry about, you know, trusting an exchange all the time. Uh, and then outside of that as well, I would say that I'm interested in technologies that are helping to utilize things like smart contracts. So again, smart contract platforms alone, like Ethereum, are exciting. So the ETH, um, the Ether token is interesting to me as well in the long term. But also, you know, things like Chainlink, uh, things like, uh, for example, I'm trying to kind of bounce through the different projects that I'm talking about. There's like the Band Protocol. There's a few other different Oracle technologies out there that are helping to communicate with the outside world, uh, tools that are helping to connect to enterprise-ready systems. So businesses can actually use blockchain and enterprise blockchain. So those are the two kind of big buzzwords, but there is some actual fundamental grounding in enterprise blockchain and decentralized finance. And uh, you can easily find online. There's a lot of great projects that are in this space. I, more than anything, like to have a little bit of exposure to everything. But putting all my eggs in one basket and trying to bet on one player usually doesn't work out. It didn't work out during a lot of the big tech waves like the dot-com bubble. It didn't work out really uh, as well as uh, at a diversified portfolio in the last rally of equities over the last decade. So uh, I think more than anything, it's important to have that kind of exposure. Because all of those use cases I mentioned of decentralized finance, of enterprise blockchain, those are two use cases. Uh, they're kind of broad terms, but they are... The true, the true two categories I can think about after being in this space since 2016 and 2017, the true use cases that I actually see value for. And the reason why is because when it comes to enterprises, you can talk about you know whether it be commercial banks interacting with one another or two corporate entities interacting with one another. There are certain types of transactions. There are certain types of interactions between those businesses that, for example, let's say, Alex, you and I are like two different corporations. We may work in the same industry. We might despise one another. We might work in like, you know, in, in competing industries and stuff and maybe uh, semiconductors or software. But at the same time, we want to have something that as much as we don't trust one another, we want to be able to work together in regards to and be able to make transactions uh, and actually transfer value and collaborate when we can, right? So having a blockchain or smart contracts to make contractual agreements in very unique ways, that's an incredibly valuable use case. Instead of having to deal with intermediaries that make the whole process much more expensive, a bunch of the middlemen that actually make these things happen uh, and make sure that they happen in a legal process, you don't really need legal anymore. You need code in this case. Code is what's basically going to determine what happens if this, then that, right? That's kind of the, the whole philosophy of, of the function of smart contracts. In regards to uh, DeFi, the whole value proposition of allowing anyone in the world to be able to earn interest on their savings and the currency of their choice, to be able to make trades uh, that are you know processed through a smart contract and decentralized, and again, permissionless and open to everyone, permissionless finance. That's the amazing value proposition that I don't have to ask for permission to make this trade and I don't have to wait to go through a third party. I can just simply swap an asset with you as, as I would be handing dollars to you and you would be giving me some kind of thing, you know, you know, just I always build an example like trade. It's like you're giving me a, like an apple or a banana or something and I'm giving you cash for it. Uh, we should be able to have these free exchanges. And I think that's the kind of proposal that DeFi has and possibly in the same time, cut down fees, uh, build a better experience, and be able to uh, hopefully make the whole experience better for people in the long term. Again, I think we're far ways away from it, uh, but there's a good chance of it as well. So if, I, if I'm looking for any opportunities, that's definitely one of them. And in, in terms of opportunities, I think you really hit the nail on the head there, Nicholas, when you're talking about how we're creating permissionless finance and finance 2.0, because over the cross, over the history of finance, as you know, it's always been extremely exclusive where it's very privileged people behind closed doors that will sign contracts and make you know a shitload of money before an IPO, et cetera, et cetera. But this time, and this is to me the most exciting part about decentralized finance is that we, the normal people, the average Joes, can get access to a market even before the institutions and all these privileged people. So uh, I don't know if that message resonates with you, but to me, it means the world. Oh, absolutely. I, that was the problem that I think we saw in the crypto space back in 2017 is that uh, you know, there, there still was a 
a sense of exclusivity. And that's what I think what DeFi is fixing. Uh, to build on your point, Alex, th this is my kind of vision, you know, to put it in a kind of a macro perspective. You know, I, I think in the future, what we're going to see is more and more of a push for like digital wallets, people becoming their own banks, not having to trust, you know, uh, too much in regards to like centralized institutions. And I think that, you know, whether or not there's a mixture, I think there's going to be a mixture of the two. We're going to live in a world where above all, the key priority is, is that someone in Kenya right now, someone in Kenya with a simple mobile device in their hands can get the exact same opportunities that you or I can, whether you're in the UK, I'm in the US, you know, and that person's in Kenya. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. So long as you have that base technological device, you have access to every single opportunity that everyone else has. I mean, this is the next internet in this case. So the kind of uh, wealth transfer that this would bring for everyday people, the sheer improvement to life and quality of life for everyday people who are working and, you know, just to get by and go through ends meet. I mean, this is going to be revolutionary if we can do this right. And if we can collaborate as a space together to make it happen, it's it's not a matter of, you know, I, what I hate in crypto is I see a lot of intercompetition and stuff. Crypto is open. It, most of it is open source code. And it's a matter of building systems that collaborate and work with one another as seamlessly as possible so we can go from the minute market share we have right now to something that dominates the traditional financial sector. That's our real enemy. You know, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, these people who, again, are either just starting to look at crypto or still bashing it. They have every incentive to do so on a, on a truly like macro level. So what we need to see now is a lot more collaboration, building those tools and making sure we do everything in our power, whether it's on a regulatory framework or in a technological framework to make sure that people get access to those opportunities equally, no matter where they're, where they're born or where they come from, it should be open to everyone. Beautiful, yes, collaboration, cooperation, right? Instead of constant competition and tribalism, I'm with you 1 million percent there, Nicholas. And you just mentioned the perfect transition to the final topic since we're we're talking about DeFi. And uh, we, I would love to ask you more about DigiFox as well because, you know, invest and earn are two things that you know a lot about. Um, we talked about this in our last call actually a few weeks ago and it really, it, I just, just started thinking about it a lot after the call and I think this is something we need to share with everyone out there. Um, so my question would be related to earning. So, and this is something we, we kind of joked about together is nowadays, you know, like earning is massive and with, with Digifox in your platform, you're offering something really interesting, which we'll cover later, um, something that people should definitely look into. But there are some risk factors as well. You know, we it, this show is called Kryptonites, as in crypto, the Kryptonite of Superman. So even if something is really awesome, there's always an, <laughs> a negative thing to it, right? <clears throat> but I want to start by asking you, like, in terms of choosing a platform for earning, for yielding interest, because as you know, guys, as of today, for those watching out there, your bank in the US or in the UK is not going to bring you more than 1.5%. For your savings account, if you're lucky, you know, it will be that high. Um, but at the same time, what worries me, Nicholas, is sometimes you see some platforms, you know, offering you 20%, like 15 to 20% on their yields. And when you look at the course of history, for instance, in the UK, 13.56% uh, was the highest in the past 60 years. And that was in 1994, and it, it wasn't sustainable. In the US as well, it's never gone over like 14, 15%. And that was back in the days, we're talking about three, four decades ago, maybe our, our, our parents' generation, right? Where they're all lining up to get the yields uh, from their savings account. But what are the risk return factors? And could you give us a little bit of advice on how to find a platform that we could truly trust in terms of earning yields? I think that's a great point, Alex, because the thing is, as much as I'm optimistic for DeFi, you see uh, it's ironic because there's a lot of people building these financial applications, but you have people who come from more of a tech background or more of a startup background. And the problem is, is that many of them are making the same kind of mistakes or are using the same kind of tactics and tricks, again, that lead to those exorbitant high, exorbitantly high rates. So, for example, a lot of the platforms that are paying like 20, 30 percent on uh, deposits are usually financing that through VCs or venture capital. So it's not sustainable if you have yields like that. And again, as you mentioned, historically speaking, banks have never paid rates those high on average. So yeah, I would, I would discount anyone who's paying 20 or 30%. The important thing to really look at here, though, is to look at what commercial banks are making on average. This is a, speaking still to this topic here about how you find something that's kind of trustworthy, providing a real market yield. 
The commercial banks right now on an annual basis here in the U.S. alone, we make 24%. Uh, banks, I don't per se make 24% because I'm not a bank, but banks make 24% at the end of the day. And that's billions of dollars that are siphoned away from the actual depositors that make up those lending and borrowing institutions, the banks themselves. So what you see in the crypto, uh, cryptocurrency space is an emergence of a lot of new cryptocurrency lending platforms that are lending out to margin traders, to exchanges, to a lot of different borrowers who need uh, instant liquidity, really quick credit. Uh, and they're able basically to charge anywhere from around 11 to 13 percent, sometimes as low as 10 percent. And on the other end, the depositors get the majority of the returns back. Uh, they get anywhere from six to eight percent, sometimes as high as nine percent, uh, if there's a lot of uh, you know demand for deposits. So basically, it's built this dynamic where a lot of these cryptocurrency or kind of new fintech banks have basically uh, found a really good market where there's a lot of demand for capital. And along with that as well, on the other side, uh, you have a lot of different people who want to earn interest on their stable coins, on their cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin, whatever it may be. And you're able to make a decent rate of interest. It's mainly on the stable coins, though. That's where, that's where you get those kind of high yields of 6 to 8% because exchanges, margin traders, all these different types of individuals and companies, they need very instant liquidity, right? And the traditional banking industry has not been able to provide that liquidity. So what I think this is going to branch out to in the longer term is that we're going to see a lot more demand on the borrowing side come from areas of the world where traditional banking isn't lending to. And that's emerging markets. It's a lot of real world activities outside of just this kind of cryptocurrency world we live in. I think it's going to reach to a lot of people. And just to speak a little bit more relevant, I, I know you asked a very valuable question, Alex. How do you really find that good platform? Uh, you need to understand a little bit about the security practices. You need to see whether or not they're working, if they already have one or if they're not, working towards getting insurance policies to make sure that funds are safe because in the world of crypto, you know, digital assets are immutable. It's a very important reality to focus on. So those are the things that we're really focused on. Uh, and the, in the case of Digifox, we're an aggregator platform. We bring the best financial services in the market into one singular application. And when it comes to earning interest on in your savings, uh, we work with the best partners out there. We have decentralized ones and also centralized ones. We have ones like Celsius Network that have been leading the world in the sense of crypto deposits. Uh, but we also have decentralized smart contract based platforms like Compound where you have little to no trust of any third parties. So it's really cool. I think I think having that variety is very important, uh, but again, also making sure that we can present that information for users to make sure they know what they're getting into, who they're trusting their money with is very important. So we're working on that extensively as we start to add more lending partners and build out a competitive marketplace. We hope that yields will not only remain high, and basically the way that that happens is by squeezing down borrowing rates so they're much more favorable for borrowers and also squeezing up the yield for depositors. And the only person who gets hurt there is the middleman. So people have to compete. It's a true free market. Unlike the traditional banking sector, which over the last few decades has been consolidating extensively. And as you've seen a direct drop um, in the amount of banks and commercial branches that are available, you've also seen a decline in those yields as well that you had mentioned uh, that we saw back in the 1970s and the 1980s, where yields used to be 7 or 8% in the United States. Awesome, awesome. But really good tip right there. You said that um, staking stable coins or, or actually going for stable coins in terms of earning and lending. A lot of the people that I've talked to in the past and even our friends at Celsius, they've said that, you know, the stable coins are the most popular in terms of staking. Um, and does that make sense to you as well? Is that a good where good place to start when it comes to earning yield and interest? Yeah, I think it's the killer application that's going to spark the next wave in crypto because if you think about it from like an end user perspective, and I think there could be many people here in the call, as I mentioned, who might be, you know, just looking to get into crypto. You know, I, I try to think about it from that perspective. When you're looking at things like Bitcoin and you're looking at things like Ethereum, you know, to a lot of us, it just it's just second nature. We get it. But for a lot of people, it's extensively confusing. And the thing about something like, uh, you know, Celsius, for example, and the way that we've integrated it, it's basically a system where we build all the tools for you to switch over from your traditional bank into becoming your own bank yourself by having stable coins in your crypto wallet and then being able to plug into Celsius. And that's a clear utility. Like anyone can get seven or eight percent interest. Like that's a huge return compared to what you're getting at your traditional commercial bank. So uh, and they, the only way they do this is by sharing 80 percent of their profits with the community. So, again, people see that value proposition. It's a replacement for one of the major aspects of their banks. And then they start to realize, well, wait a minute, this wallet that I have it can do everything my bank does. Soon we're gonna have like a debit card feature in the wallet. We're gonna make it where you can receive your income directly into the wallet from your company. And you could also receive it in the form of crypto that you
you want, or you could just have it in USDC. And then we not only start to imitate what a traditional bank is, right? Even though we're not a bank, you're your own bank as the user. That's the really cool thing. But outside of that as well, you can start to add a ton of new features. And as the DeFi space grows, as we start to build some in-house technologies uh, that further improve the experience, it's the whole idea of building your all-in-one finance app. Um, and that's kind of the vision we're going for. I think that once you can build a better replacement for your traditional bank, then that's when you're gonna get the next wave of people. And then that's when you pitch them the idea of like, hey, you can buy digital assets if you want. Here's Bitcoin. Here's ways where you can earn Bitcoin where you don't have to spend any money. Uh, you know, that's that's our kind of philosophy is to treat crypto assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum as nothing more than just that, they're assets, right? Um, but to utilize the underlying technology on networks like Ethereum to build really exciting applications and build a really optimal user experience. Yeah, that's that's a key to mass adoption, right? Everything you put in out there is literally check, 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 and then anyone can come in. And I think you're right. It's a really good point. Personally, I like to swing trade as well, kind of like you, and use simple techniques with you know resistance and support. In, ultra simple, but it does tend to work quite uh, well. And you know, for me to lock in or or to stake a specific cryptocurrency that's volatile, I would rather trade it because that 15% per annum, I can probably make more than that through swing trades, simple swing trades. But when it comes to like the assets that I trust, you know, long term, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, like you're mentioning, or stable coins that don't have, even if they have volatility, you know that, you know, five years from now, they'll, they'll likely be here. I'm very happy to stake. Is that kind of how you're using it personally at the moment or? Precisely. Yeah. So we basically like for our Celsius integration right now, if you were to download the app, you'll only see one market and that's USDC. Uh, we believed in making sure above all, we know that stable coin staking is kind of the key metric. That's what people want. Eventually we'll have Bitcoin, Litecoin and Ethereum and some of the other major players. But we wanted to keep it extremely simple because I think that's the key use case. When it comes to Bitcoin, as you mentioned, Alex, it's, it's a matter of, or sorry, not so much Bitcoin, but digital assets abroad, specifically, uh, more specifically altcoins. I think people are holding it mainly for speculative reasons right now. There's no doubt about that, to be fair. Um, it, but I think at the same time, you know, when it comes to the actual mechanism of staking or, you know, kind of saving money in the long term, you know, altcoins really aren't in that position just yet. Maybe if they become less volatile and become more of a you know store of value in some capacity. But I think that they're really going to be much more volatile than the kind of crypto monies of the world like Bitcoin and Ethereum, because those are really meant to be one thing. They're meant to be, you know, you know, store value. They're meant to be a hedge. They're they're really becoming new financial instruments. So, anyways, yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's a it's a tough question. I think there's there's some people, as you mentioned, who might be on the opposite end, Alex, that might be crazy about staking the most volatile cryptos in the world. Uh, we hope to offer some form of staking services as well in the app. But that's uh, again, it's something that's kind of a. I think it's it's a small thing comparative to the kind of scale of what earning six, six to eight percent interest on your deposits is going to do in the long term. I think that's a killer app that just anyone with dollars in their bank account they can get behind when they see that their bank is walking away with tens of billions of dollars every quarter and you're not receiving much of it at all as the depositor. And you guys, I think you said in the UK, if you can get 1.5%, man, that's good. I think I think the best here in the <laughs> States is like a fraction of a percentage on a money market account. It's like, oh my God, yeah, that's like, really bad. It's it's crazy, man. Yeah, it's, it's not a fun environment. Now, of course, what's funny is, uh, I, and this is something, again, I learned from me in crypto. I met a, a guy who worked in uh, property uh, property development in Australia. And we always, I was talking about the concept of the, the company at the time. And he said, he's like, oh, Nick, that, that's not the lowest interest rate you can get because if you call up your bank and you got $50 million on the books, you know, then they'll be like, oh, yo, we can we can pay you three or 4%. We'll just start bumping up the rate a little bit. <laughs> so then you have that negotiation power and, and they know that they need to keep the deposits because without deposits, banks are nothing. They're just a face and a name. And they basically are a middleman that circulates capital. Uh, and they provide a very valuable service, which is credit management. So basically determining who's credit worthy, who can they process loans to and not have defaults and put money in, in proper places and earn a yield. So it's a very valuable service, uh, but they don't invent anything. They don't really create any physical product. Um, more than anything, your dollars are what's creating the value at the end of the day. They're just simply managing it. So I think we, we need to put it in the hands of people who really pay it forward to depositors who save long term. I want to build a saver economy. We don't have that nowadays. It's all about spending, speculation, and consumerism. I, I want to build something that focuses on investing in long term things, buying your first home, investing in your child's you know education, raising a family, like things like that really kind of get me going. And that's why I'm really excited and stuff, hopefully for this new future of finance. 
that savers economy makes a hundred percent sense, especially for Western countries where people struggle to save and it's all about consumerism and spending your money quickly compared to when I lived in Japan, where people, you know, they can lose their job for three years in a row and they still have enough capital, you know, to survive. So uh, I really like that message and really hope that, you know, Digifox will achieve that specific feature. Uh, one last question. I know I, I could talk to you for hours, man, Nicholas, man. I just love talking with you. And when you once you come to the UK, let's definitely do that on the real production set. But um, my last question, and this comes from the community, they were just saying, you know, oh, can you ask Nicholas on what is his favorite technical analysis indicator? We know that it's always a combination of indicators, but a lot of them were just, you know, kind of beginning into this thing and, and kind of excited to start using TradingView, you know, just to start looking at some basic things. Are there any particular uh, TA indicators or signals that you're you're enjoying these days in terms of seeing where the price could possibly go? Yeah, Alex, thank you very much. I, I all, all the same back to you, man. I really appreciate you having me on. And in the sense of that question, you know, I'll give two answers because I, I'm I'm first going to go ahead and give a technical indicator. Well, I'll, be fair, I'll be fair to the question, but I'll also make a point afterwards. Uh, the first indicator that I'd recommend is, is as people are actually using TradingView, we actually created a custom aggregate indicator of three of my favorites. So there's three indicators, the squeeze momentum indicator, the MACD, and the stochastic RSI. And we aggregate those into one specific indicator called the SMS strategy. So if you look up SMS, you'll be able to find it on TradingView. And it's created by a, a guy named, uh, his, his, his uh, name is San Rocks. His, his name's Sandeep. He's one of our community members for our newsletter. And he put it together. It's a phenomenal indicator. And it's best used on longer term time frames as a swing trader for monthly or uh, weekly time frames. It's called not only some of the bull markets uh, in regards to crypto markets, but outside of this, well, in gold and silver and a few other different asset classes. Basically, uh, it, if it flips over three points and turns green, that's usually when we go bullish or get optimistic about something. And so long as it holds above there, it's in an upward trend uh, until we flip down into the red. But um, yeah, it's, it, I know that's an aggregate of three indicators. It's a free tool for anyone to use that we built. Um, but in regards to, uh, in the sense of like my real answer to that question, as much as I love the SMS and I've got a few different tools I'll use from time to time, like moving averages, whatever it may be, the major thing that I like to use is as you referred to, Alex, which is kind of naked trading. And no, you don't have to be naked for it. You can still wear your clothes, but uh, basically <laughs> it's, it's using support and resistance. It's basically looking for general ranges where you see price having difficulty reaching to new highs or where it tends to hold support and hold strong and not go below. Uh, that's the key thing, using very simple lines of support using general technical patterns, but I think technical patterns are much more relevant on longer term timeframes. That's the key metric, using support and resistance on longer term timeframes. Most people have the habit of looking at the minute chart, the hourly chart, four hour chart of the daily chart. You gotta start looking at the weekly, the monthly, and in some cases for some very large markets on trading view, you can get kind of creative with it. If, if you get one of the paid uh, plans, you can do like three month, six month, 12 month candles. So you have entire years summarized into one candle and you can see this very, very broad trends uh, and, and simplify it. Once you get that overview, you can see, ah, I know what I'm going to get probably like what the probability is of something happening in this time frame. Here's where it usually tops out. This should be where I, I should be setting up for a certain, you know, three, six, nine, 12 month trade. And I can tell you the more I've done that, my returns have increased. Uh, my livelihood's been better. I don't have to worry about watching the markets 24 seven. I can more than anything kind of enjoy the price action and just kind of be like, oh wow, this is like a 10% move. Well, my target's for like 200% over the next few months. So we're almost there. Like, you know, we just, we just got it started and stuff. So it's like, you know, it's a fun thing and it makes you not nervous about the price action. You'll start to build that kind of long-term mentality of like, wow, Patience really pays. And I think you get that, Alex, of course. But I, I think just for the, if I could say anything to you know the audience and stuff here, I, I would say that that's probably the biggest lesson. And it's almost kind of rewarding just to see that the patience pays off. Yeah, and you know, that's really what I love about your channel. And for those who are not subscribed to Data Dash channel, definitely subscribe today, guys. If you don't have a lot of time in your week, keep that as one of your three go-tos that you should definitely follow every single time there's a video that comes out simply because I think Nicholas, you, you keep it simple, but also you're not afraid of using a macro lens, zooming in for a micro lens, and you, you kind of look at it from all angles. You're, you're not deep, deep into those analysts who just look at, you know, have 500 lines on their, their charts. It's all messy and difficult to understand. I think simple, but yet using different uh, frames, you know, uh, very effectively. And, and it's it's been really good. I really appreciate all the, the work you've done with Data Dash, man. 
Thank you, Alex. I appreciate it. Yeah, to just finally build on that point there again, if, if people want to trade like an institutional trader, that's how they do it. They, there's no magical one all, one all be all indicator in the world. There's some that might have good accuracy, yeah. but if you really want to like get the insights that, that institutional traders use, and I think as you mentioned, you probably agree, Alex, it's using support and resistance. It's those longer term time frames. No institutional traders is a day trader at the end of the day. That's the key thing. It's very, very rare for that to be the case. So uh, yeah, thank you, Alex. I mean, this has been a fantastic conversation, and uh, I'm 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 happy to be on here, and I'm happy to see that we we see eye to eye on a lot of things in regards to the markets. One hundred percent, man, and really appreciate it today, guys. We covered some amazing topics. We went through Bitcoin stock to flow, potential price action. Then we kind of zoomed into portfolio allocation, diversification. But we also talked about DeFi, one of the growing trends and in earning interest, yields, lending. Of course, DigiFox, guys. Don't forget to download DigiFox. While you're there, download also the Swiss Board Wealth app, which is also an aggregator, kind of like a sky scanner. So the combination of both is really the perfect world for crypto. I don't think you need more than that, right? <laughs> no, I don't think it is. You can buy all the cryptos you want, earn all the interest you want. I think it's all there. <laughs> awesome, brother. So definitely when you come to London, let's do something here and uh, let's get you on the real production set because I feel like we could talk for hours and... Uh, and it could be a lot of fun. Absolutely. We had, we had to stop ourselves. We could go on for a couple more hours. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go, guys. Don't forget to like, comment, and blast that bell notification. And I'll see you guys again next week, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock BST. Take care, guys.